<laughs> Can't even press got it. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> this is a great start to the meeting. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to uh, an artist guide of laser cutting and image preparation. Very official. I'm Monica. <laughs> Hello, hi. Uh, I work as a visual artist and puppeteer and cartographer. Um, my work is in the Eastern Edge Gallery in the Rogue uh, room, gallery part. Um, I create work digitally by hand um, and uh, sometimes a combination of those two things. I've been using a laser cutter for a little bit over a year now. Um, as a cartographer uh, with an easy transition of making digital files and, and printing them, that's essentially what that uh, working with plotters or inkjet printers is a lot like working with laser cutters. Um, I use a Mac and my laser printer is a Glowforge. Um, and then the software that I use is a Pixelmator, Pixelmator Pro, um, Procreate and Sketch, and then the Glowforge has an app that it's web-based that you can send your files to and it will process them. Um, <laughs> because <laughs> lasers and cats are entwined in my heart, I've tried to put a cat on every slide. So if you get bored or lost, you can just try and look for the cat paraphernalia. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna go through just uh, some just basic information about laser cutters. Uh, I have a CO2 laser, so that's what most of this conversation will be about. Um, if you have any questions, interrupt me, it'll be great. Um, we'll talk a little bit about image files and their pre preparation, the difference between cutting and engraving, image resolution, uh, my actual laser printer, because I don't know others, and, um, and then the types of materials that you can use, and essentially how you prepare a file to print, which I think might be helpful for you if you're sending your work off to other places. And then just some examples of things that I've made. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, I paid money for this image because it was so integral. <laughs> to the flow yeah it, it cost me 13 dollars, and I was like this is really expensive but it was really important okay so another thing that I just wanted to talk about a little bit is about um ergonomics and, and repetitive strain injuries uh I work a lot with computers and uh, they are a magnificent things but they can also be very physically painful and so um I got hurt working on a computer uh, and it prevented me from making art for several years so uh I just want it's like a it's a pitch to just like make sure that you're not working consecutively for hours without taking breaks make sure that you get some aerobic activity throughout the day to break it up that we're not meant to be computer monkeys and uh, um, that bad for as new friends. Um, so yeah, the general rule is just to take a, a two to three minute break every half hour if you're working on a computer um, and watch repetitive actions, which is like pretty much all art making and uh, your posture and to check your setup. So at home, I use a sit-stand desk and a Wacom tablet pen thing. Um, and so I'm essentially drawing as I with the mouse the whole day and stretch. So that's, that's, my, that's my safety demonstration for today. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's just super important because we all use computers and we're all hunched monkeys. Lasers are uh, highly focused amplified light. And uh, laser cutters, like I mentioned before, are essentially inkjet printers in a, in a weird way, right? You prepare a file, it prints it for you. There are many types of laser cutters. The most um, that are used by artists and hobbyists and small businesses are gas and CO2 lasers. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then the type of laser cutter you have means that you're cutting uh, materials based on its power. Um, so, that we use the names interchangeably. There are differences, but they, they are long and they are minute. Fundamentally, most laser cutters can engrave and most laser engravers can cut. Uh, people refer to them sometimes as what they are used most for. I put a link into the presentation, which will be accessible to everyone. So you can read more about the minutia if that's really exciting to you. Um, so CO2 laser cutters, my, mine is a Glowforge. It's a laser printer is how they market it. 
Um, it has a laser tube much like on this slide and it shoots out um, and reflects off of mirrors and gets focused on a laser head. And that laser head is a little bit like, you know, where you would put your ink cartridges are, you know, and where the print head kind of prints material. So that, um, that laser is burning or melting or vaporizing whatever material that you're sending to it to create your art. Um, <laughs> for anyone that has worked a lot with image files, uh, it is, <laughs> it is, there, there are many, um, uh, raster files are the most commonly used. That's like when we take a photo with our phone, we're using JPEGs. Um, when you're creating something in a, in a software, it's usually a raster. You set a DPI and you're creating whatever you want in, in Procreate. For instance, vector files are different. Um, you can cut and engrave with both types of files. Rasters are pretty much you're uh, limited to engraving only. And I'll talk a little bit about that too. But just know that there are vectors and there are rasters. And the next couple of slides will hopefully not be super boring. Uh, but if I had a software like Adobe, for instance, Illustrator, um, Photoshop, then you could be probably saving those files interchangeably, but I don't do the subscription service um, thing at this time. And so I have to use things like Pixelmator Pro and um, Sketch to make my vector files. So raster files. Um, you can boil a raster file essentially down to like pixel art, you know, where every pixel that you're creating gets a hue, a tone, a color. Um, and when you blow up, uh, when you blow up a raster file, uh, it can sometimes be really pixelated um, around the edges. And so a raster file is often what we use for engraving. Um, and, uh, and so keep that in mind, rasters and vectors, the boring, it's not so boring when you put a cat with glasses on it, but uh, rasters are pixel art. So let's just keep that in mind. And then vector files are totally different. If you scale up a vector file, uh, it keeps the shape. Uh, it's clearer. It's sometimes smaller, um, but it is essentially a bunch of points and lines that create paths. They're created with mathematical formulas and they're very easily scalable. There's a cat on every slide in case you get bored. Mm -hmm. um, so to continue just about image files, we're talking about image files and how they relate to laser cutting and engraving. So for a vector image, you're creating that in something that um, will allow you to draw them, you can cut them and you can engrave them for vectors. For rasters, you pretty much can only engrave those. Uh, the <laughs> when we talk about laser cutting, um, you're essentially burning into the material um, the shape that you define it. So in that case, there are birds. I brought some examples of things that I've cut straight through. Um, so in order to prevent the burning on a lot of materials, we mask it. We mask it either with a, a, a big roll of masking tape, like in my case, masking tape over wood or masking tape over paper. Um, and in some cases, the plastics and things like that will already have a mask on them. Uh, with mirror acrylics, you sometimes put a double mask on it so that the reflection doesn't cause burning in the surface itself. So that's how you get like clean, nice cuts that tempt cat paws. Uh, kerf is something that might be familiar to people that have done woodworking before where they're kind of adjusting for the cut of the blade itself. If you're kind of doing precise work, mercifully in laser cutting, kerf is not a big deal. But um, it sounds cool, so I have included a cat um, to relay that. Uh, laser engraving is the part that's most like, in my mind, an inkjet printer. It, it kind of burns in a sequential form the pattern that you're sending to it. Um, you can engrave into all different types of materials, um, but it doesn't cut all the way through if you're doing it correctly. <laughs> I brought examples where I haven't done it correctly and also a test case to show you kind of what that looks like. If you want to pass that around, this is like, depending on the type of speed and the power that you're using on your machine, it creates different, um, um, kind of indentations in the wood. Um, uh, 
something that's important is image resolution when you're working with digital files. The standard, I think, is 300 dpi. Um, to make it really confusing, sometimes when you're printing an image that's a photo uh, for laser cutting, you want to take that photo that's in color and convert it to a grayscale afterwards. And sometimes you're even decreasing the DPI, which is weird because you would never really want to do that with a file that you're publishing on the internet or something like that um, on a website. You're decreasing the DPI and actually prints a clearer image. Um, so an example of that I've taken here from um, Free For All Laser is like, They've printed an image, it's a photo onto a piece of material. And with 90 DPI, it's a little bit darker and it's a little bit lighter with 45 DPI. And the same thing is from Trotec laser. Uh, they've got like, but it's the reverse, right? They're, they're etching onto metal and the 250 DPI is kind of cloudy and the 1000 DPI is very clear. So the game of laser etching is that you're actually just playing with all those settings per material, per image to try and figure out the right one. And they have a little guide on the Trotec website that tells you kind of what resolutions they might suggest for the material that you're using. Um, oh yeah, so these are some things about the Glowforge that I have. It is as high as a cat. Um, it is a U.S. company. It has an incredibly um, helpful user interface, great customer service, a, like a really strong community where you can ask a question and people within that community, once you have that laser cutter, you, you, um, you can post within that forum. And so there's many people helping other people out with problems that they have. Um, it is very expensive. Uh, it's because it's from the U.S., the shipping is high, uh, you've got customs and duties, um, and with CO2 lasers, you do have to replace the tube um, after a while. But um, those are all things I might have wanted to know before buying one. <laughs> it obviously didn't prevent me from buying it and using my year's tuition for it. Uh, but <laughs> you automatically don't have an extended warranty with the machine because um, you live, if you are buying one here, uh, because you're in Canada and it's a US-based company. That being said, um, there's a whole bunch of replacement parts you can order on the internet and the forum does help you work through, uh, the customer service does help you work through problems that you might have. Um, it's not ginormous. It's 38 inches by 20 inches, essentially. Um, it can accommodate, materi accommodate materials that are 12 inches to 20 inches, the one that I have. Uh, and it also has a pass-through slot so that you can take off the guards to make sure that you're not coming into contact or viewing any of the laser when you're passing materials through it. You can kind of cut eight inch sections at a time when you're doing a long print. Um, like um, 11 by 19 and a half inches wide and it can cut up to two inches worth of material um, if you take out the crumb tray that's there to collect all the things that you don't mean to make tiny pieces of it goes through um it goes through the back through the front um so it's kind of like it yeah uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly like that. Um, huh, things I wish I knew before buying a laser cutter that lives in your house. Uh, extreme temperature or humidity is something that affects it. And they say to not cut in an environment that is over 75% humid. <laughs> and so like in St. John's, that kind of gives you like 30 to days a year but in reality like I have a little temperature and humidity reader by my machine and uh and I try to cut when it's um drier <laughs> if it's drier then it, you won't find me I'll be in the house I'll be laser cutting you won't find me um 
You can use a dehumidifier in the room that it lives, absolutely, but it does affect it if it's like raining outside or if there's any condensation that can get through the hose into the machine, it can affect it. So that's a very good, I, I, I did buy a dehumidifier, very smart, it's the right answer. Um, so yeah, and it needs to kind of be stored in indoors unless you have the magic of having a temperature control shed that's that will allow you to keep it between 16 and 24 inches uh, Celsius, degrees Celsius. It's smelly. Uh, so that's the thing, right? It lives in your house. It's totally safe for it to be in your house, but it does produce smell. So I usually like to cut materials that are paper, cardboard, wood. Plastic's really smelly. It lingers. Um, even though if you're running the house fan and you've got it extracting out, it's still smelly. So, and it's something that you like, you know, it's where the guests stay. <laughs> so, <laughs> statistically, you have to take out some of the days of the year for that. Um, oh, and then the, the glass on the actual laser bed itself uh, is the type of eyeglass wear that you would be wearing if you were um, like there. It's the same glasses that you would be wearing if you bought PPE. So they've tried to seal the entire machine up so that it's safe, that you can view it and they can have it in a classroom and stuff like that. Um, the, the caveat is if you have a Glowforge Pro that has the pass through slot, which is what I have, you have to be wearing, I think, glasses while using it. I would at least, um, just in case light were to leak out while you're doing one of those pass through prints. Um, so that's, that's one of the things. And you also need to have like a, a working carbon monoxide detector around. What are the, you think they're, they're being, uh, they can be. I went to a Canadian um, laser cutting supplier and I think my glasses were like $30, $45. So they weren't super prohibited, but they can be very expensive. Um, depending on the type of the type of class laser you have. So um, laser cutters can cut a variety of materials. Uh, one of the things that I didn't know necessarily was just that you could, you can cut and engrave pretty much anything, but it's not always safe to do so. So there's laser proof materials that um, you would opt to use. If you use things that aren't laser proof in my machine, the warranty would be null and void because it's not meant to cut like pies, but they do engrave like faces on pies all the time. Like you see people doing it um, and, and like, and a whole bunch of stuff that I think have come from Target, you know, that's like been engraved beautifully. Um, that's just part of the deal. You can choose to engrave, you know, your dog's face into a uh, like a wooden mug if you want. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good thing. I mean, if you're in a room that has multiple different types of acrylic, um, I would hope that you would know <laughs> you would have some sort of labeling structure, but um, that's not all acrylics are the same, right? You want to be using cast acrylic with a laser. Um, there's a great local supplier of cast acrylic here. Um, and I've tried it. I didn't set anything on fire. Mm -hmm. Great. That's always what you want when you're cutting with lasers, right? Um, but yeah, so there, there is a recommendation of the type of wood that you could use from Home Depot in this presentation, um, and then some resources of where you can buy those types of materials that are laser proof that are kind of more local or at least Canadian, because it does get expensive if you're going for that, for more stuff. Um, yes. There are things like laserable leather and fabric and paper even. There's uh, stuff that's two-tone so that when you burn into the acrylic, there's another thing underneath. Like the Eastern Edge logo, for instance, would be a great two-tone kind of um, thing. Uh, and then like everything smells regardless of what, <laughs> regardless of what it's cutting, it's burning into it. Um, and so it, it it's just all produces fumes that are hopefully venting out 100% into the air, but there's, you're supposed to have either it venting outdoors, which is, which is suitable enough, or venting into some sort of extractor, and they sell one. Um, for a space like this, you would have to maybe have one if you don't have an, an easy vent to the outdoors. 
Is that the same type of regulation you would find in a Hoover like a Cuban bill or something like that? Like it actually like sucks that they're acting? I think so, yeah. And it uses what is essentially a dryer hose um, to go from the printer into the, the fan. Mm -hmm. um, so like I said, there's EM plastic, which I've purchased some things for, including my masking that goes over top of the paper and the wood. Uh, and then Trotec is a Canadian supplier of both machines and materials. They have a great um, kind of how to and what is a laser kind of section to their website. And then I often get my wood from Home Depot. There's um, a bunch of wood that's by Columbia Forest products. Not all the Columbia Forest products are laserable um, or laser proof. You have to check the individual descriptions, but it will tell you what it's um, okay for. And then um, the masking tape is a very important thing to have to cut, um, to save any surface that's going to have the burn into it. Even if you're engraving, you're still masking the material so that you don't have the burn. And randomly, even Etsy has a whole bunch of wood and acrylic and, and all the other laser proof stuff that you might want to get your hands on. And then there's just so many references. So I tried to put them on every slide, but in case I didn't, those were the places that I was going to to compile <laughs> information. <clears throat> everything needs, everything needs, everything needs to have a reference. Okay. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what needs to be heavily featured in this presentation to justify the $13. <laughs> um, we'll talk a little bit about this cat. So say, this was something that you wanted to etch into a material. Um, you're going to convert it into a black and white image. And depending on the level of um, clarity, you might even like cut away around the cat's ears so that you don't have that like band around it. But let's just say that it's perfect. Um, you're going to, if you wanted to cut this out of a piece of material, you would cut, you would make a vector file that goes around the raster image and that's what the laser is going to cut. And then you would be assigning it, um, kind of a speed and a power to the machine to engrave, and it would be giving it the type of material that it uses. And then you're going to cut around the material. Um, this is. I love pitcher plants. I didn't know how awesome they were until I got here. <laughs> and so I drew one on my iPad as a monster because everything in my life needs to be a monster. And um, and so this was an example. It's just like I drew the, the pitcher plant in Procreate on my iPad. And then if you're thinking about making that as a shadow puppet, because some of this <laughs> workshop, which goes hand in hand, laser cutters and shadow puppets, uh, some of some of this is trying to figure out like what what your image is going to be paper and how that's going to relate to shadow. So in this case, everything that's black is going to be the paper. Um, and this is the, the SVG file that I sent to my laser cutter um, to make the shadow puppet. And there's a piece of Duralar that's um, the face and that's you can attach that. or shards of double-sided carpet tape, which is like my favorite thing in life. <laughs> One of my favorite things. Uh, this is another example, me as a monster. Uh, this is me as a monster in a vector file. <laughs> this is me as a monster as a puppet. Very appropriate. Uh, I was gonna make this for Elijah. This is, this is gonna be for Elijah. <laughs> um, this is the half ham as a vector file. Uh, this is me cutting the half ham this afternoon because the temperature and humidity was above, below 75%. And then um, that's kind of the machine registering. It has a camera to know where it is in the material. It has two cameras or maybe three cameras um, to be able to register where it is. Um, it took 30 seconds to cut the half ham. Uh, okay, and then we just have a few more examples of things, unless I've completely bored you, in which case I'll just feed you more candy until I get to the end. Uh, great. So this is what it looks like. This is um, my laser printer. Uh, it vents outside. I put a piece of clear plastic from Tux, Tulks, 
talks talks um and uh, they cut a circle in it for me because my laser cutter wasn't set up and I couldn't set <laughs> kind of my own, a circle in my own window uh yeah but uh it's just a dryer hose that vents out to it um it is very loud did I mention that it's very loud this is how loud it is friends um right now it's cutting out some amoebas um these are the amoebas um single celled organisms that i hand paint and then make colorful um the amoebas are featured on my studio sign as with the etched qr code <laughs> it takes people to my website um this is a, a little etch that i made of um of a yeti and <laughs> it's you know very important work um i made this <laughs> i i made this oh no it's not playing uh yeah it's really loud this is it from the outside so it needed to have googling right i'm going out the window so it takes like in a good 45 minutes to an hour to etch something into wood it takes quite a long time cutting is much much quicker um and then cutting doesn't produce as much smell as it turns out um i've made some laser cutting projects before before having a laser cutter um i used a marine grade fur to uh, make some make a fence colorful for a, a local school and so um the wood ended up being just the best option to to work with the the kids um and we used a paint that uh that sealed it really nicely it was lots of priming but um it's a nice way to cut a bazillion things you kind of want to send things that you're cutting multiple times to a laser printer um i bought the laser printer pre predominantly to help me make me mechanisms and puppetry because you could spend i don't know like weeks on a bandsaw and you could take a day with a laser cutter <laughs> to make the same thing. So not that I've spent, I've spent some time with bandsaws and there's just like far less risk of me cutting off my own fingers. Um, and it, particularly if you're doing something that's less mm, exuberant or exciting, um, you know, than just like making little parts that are supposed to be the same. So the laser cutter is ideal for that. I used a laser cutter when I was building a mask for an exhibition. Uh, I used it to laser cut just the cardboard pieces itself, and then I molded it into a mask that could fit onto my face. Um, but uh, cardboard is a wonderful thing. One of the few first things I started laser cutting was like cogs so that I could make a giant robot to dispense candy. <laughs> just uh, shoots, it, sh it would shoot candy from its neck to out of its belly um it's very loud it's very loud um okay and then some of the examples is like in the eastern edge gallery i have um the shadow box and in making the shadow box i had to um try and condense a portion of the city into um into shadow and so i brought some examples of like the paper that i used and not having the right settings because sometimes you burn the paper too much or it doesn't cut through the paper and it really depends on the type of paper you're using and sometimes the masking helps and sometimes it doesn't and so all of these things are iterative um, you end up going through lots of material it's it's making art with machines that's how it goes um yeah this is it cutting tiny tiny windows maybe the so loud <laughs> this is the final result of one of the shadow box um there's just like there's only so much that your human hands could cut to make things as tiny as it gets so that's really wonderful um and then yeah yeah there's little bars on the window so there's like you know like how can you how much can you singe it <laughs> and have it still hold up you know um, and then uh, I made a cranky theater in the studio and so uh, in the gallery. And so this is like an example of like some of the file that I would have used. And I used the masking tape itself that I used to cover 
the surfaces on Duralar um, in the end to make the cranky because I was trying to make it out of paper and the paper was too fragile. And so all of this is like troubleshooting, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's an example of the final cranky. I think that's it. That was the last slide. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> We did it. We did it. Do you find 